Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Jones. I'm the Director of Education and Training for Blaze Sports America. On behalf of the United States Olympic Committee and Blaze Sports, uh, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, Working with Adapted Physical Education Teachers, Partnerships, Recruitment, and Mandate. By the end of today's webinar, we hope that you as participants will increase your knowledge on adaptive physical education and the role of adaptive physical education teachers. We also hope that you will be able to increase knowledge of school and sport federal mandates, including um, the IE, IDEA and the Rehab Act regulations, IEPs, and adaptive physical education service delivery and a general physical education inclusion. We also hope that uh, there will be some learning strategies and resources to collaborate with local adaptive physical education teachers and sports programs in your community. We hope that you'll be able to become a resource to adaptive physical education teachers in schools and also be an active uh, participant in the education individual education plans. We hope that you'll be able to promote your teams better and your programs and provide after school and sports and recreation programs in conjunction with school programs. We have two outstanding speakers with us today. Timothy Davis is associate professor from uh, the University of Cortland in upstate New York. Tim is also the chair of the Adaptive Physical Education and National Standards Program and oversees national standards and certification process in Adaptive Physical Education sponsored by the National Consortium on Physical Education Recreation for Individuals with Disabilities. Also with us today is Ann Cody, who is the Director of Policy and Global Outreach for Blaze Sports America. Ann is responsible for the developing relationships with major national and international partners and for shaping the organization's advocacy efforts in Washington, D.C. Ann is currently serves as the, on the International Paralympic Committee Governing Board, the highest ranking <coughs> woman in the IPC, uh, on the IPC. It's my pleasure, again, on behalf of Play Sports America and U.S. Paralympics to welcome both Tim and Ann with us today. Go ahead, Tim. Thank, thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate that. This is a great, uh, great honor, a great opportunity to uh, to be with you and everybody else out there. And I want to start with just by saying, this is all about making connections. And uh, you know, certainly the connection with Ann is wonderful. Now the connection with you, Jeff, is is great. Uh, but we're scattered all over the country, and if you take a look, you know, we, we're a small group, but yet when we start connecting with each other, we can be a powerful voice. So if we jump to the next slide, I think we'll be able to see that uh, these Paralympic Sport Clubs are growing, and uh, they're popping up all over the place because there's great people, great people who are doing good work, uh, practitioners to people in higher education from Alaska to Florida to Georgia to Wisconsin to Michigan. Uh, down to Arizona, and it's just fantastic. And if you take a look at that map, you can see that maybe there's somebody near you, maybe you're one of those people, but there also is some white gaps out there. There are some states that don't have anything, and we're hoping that through today's uh, webinar that we can begin making those types of connections and links. And so I'd encourage everyone today to, as you review the material uh, that I provide, the, the web links and the, and the other information, as you listen to the, the fantastic information that Ann's going to provide, um, really reach out, make those connections. I think it will be a, a, a great thing for everybody. Real quick, if, if I can just go through, this is what I get to do. I love my job. I love adapted physical education. I get the opportunity to play almost on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, so for me, adapted physical education has become a, a, a integral part of everything I do. It's a passion, and I know a lot of people out there live that same passion that I do. I think we're really blessed to do that. And if I could jump to the next slide, I, you know, we start with what's adaptive PE. Well, to me, it's an attitude. It's an attitude. And I, I was taught that when I was at Ball State University with, with Ron Davis, a uh, great mentor, and we focus on ability. And that's, that's what I still do. So when I teach teachers, when I work with kids, it's always focused on the ability. It's that belief that, you know, all children can contribute to something in some capacity in your physical education class. And whatever we do, we focus on ability. It's not, adapted PE is not a class that's, you know, more or less down the hall 
out the door. It's a dumping ground for where we can put all children with disabilities. It's, it's much more than that, and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. It's based upon established standards, knowledge content that practicing adapted physical educators need to know to do their job, and unfortunately, the vast majority only have a three-credit course in adapted, and it's also systematic. It's a systematic delivery system and a process that is involved in improving the quality of life of children with disability. We can start with, you know, the basic definition because that's really the ground of where we're at and although this is a little bit of preliminary information many of you already have and you can get this from just about any uh, quality adaptive PE text uh, that's out there. I, we happen to use the principles and methods of adaptive PE and REC, uh, the Oxter Pfeiffer Zittel Roth book and fantastic information there. So as you can see the, the definition includes instruction in physical education and if we jump to the next slide we can see that the, the definition of physical education is also there, and, and, and it's the same for children with disabilities. Uh, primary difference is that we may individualize it. We may focus a little bit more on specific patterns or skills that children need to work on. If we look at an operational definition of what adapted PE is, uh, besides being an attitude, besides being a lot of fun, it's truly the art and science. It's that combination of really reaching out and looking at that individual and seeing them for who they are, seeing them for their ability, and using that information to then make sound decisions, using good assessment data to make good decisions about uh, the quality of physical education that children should receive across not just K through 12 or, or pre-K through 12, but really through the lifespan so that we can promote quality, daily, physical active lifestyles for, for all children in a, in a universally designed way, in a, in a, in a way that, that isn't separate, specialized, but really is designed to encompass all participants. I like to think of, uh, if we jump to the next slide there, Jeff, I like to think of adapted PE, and, and a lot of people believe this. It certainly is within the law that we're direct service providers. We reach out to children, and we do hands-on work with kids, highly specialized in terms of that content knowledge. We base our decisions on sound assessment. We evaluate their motor competency, and we implement uh, a, a sound quality physical education program that many cases can be delivered in such a way that's um, certainly inclusive. Uh, we can push in and do a variety of things in general physical education, but we can also work away from that particular um, inclusive model and deliver services in a separate um, placement option. So there's a variety of ways that the service that we provide um, can be done. We also see a lot of benefits from adaptive PE services, certainly the increase in physical activity of children. Uh, that's, that's paramount in terms of what we uh, do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, great teachers out there, Donna Levitro in Arizona, for example, always active in getting our kids going. Just fantastic. And it's focused on the remediation of those secondary disabling conditions, those, those conditions that, um, you know, the, the, the types of things that are prompted by being sedentary. And so we're really looking to improve the quality of life of, of every child that we meet, and it's through individualized planning that that occurs. And it's promoting the notion of equal access to, really, to the community, to the curriculum, to the facilities. And often those barriers are not just physical barriers. They're attitudinal barriers. They're program barriers. So we need to think when we plan uh, for community programs, when we plan our curriculum, when we plan our facilities, we need to think about the notion of universal access and the idea of generalizable, functional, and meaningful skills and opportunities for kids uh, of all ages to play, you know, in, in all together. Some of the roles that the adapted physical educator provides is really that bridge across um, all ages, and we're direct service providers, like I said. We certainly work on referral, and we do assessment. We're involved with service, uh, obviously, and placement, making sound placement decisions across the continuum of where the children uh, should be in regards to the least restricted environment. Um, we're integrally in involved with teaching 
and making modifications, sometimes on the fly, sometimes with equipment, uh, sometimes with the teaching style that we're using. And more importantly, though, we're engaged with planning and evaluating. So as we work in the, in the school environment or the community environment, we certainly consult. We need to work on, you know, be team players, reach out to other groups, and this is a great way. The webinar is really all about doing just that, uh, advocating for all ability levels and advocating for opportunity. We have to be good decision makers, though, along the way. And a major part of being, a, I believe, to be a good decision maker is, is knowing your knowledge, knowing your content, uh, knowing the, uh, the standards that uh, really are the foundation of, of what we do. And last but not least is being that, that, that role model that, uh, um, where we live it and we breathe it. And it's so exciting to see young children that we've worked with go on and do uh, great things in the community. But like I said, all of this information is driven by standards. And as Jeff uh, kindly put, I am currently the chair of the adapt to National Standards. This is sponsored by the National Consortium for Physical Education and Recreation for Individuals with Disabilities. Dr. Garth Timeson, Dr. Ron Davis, and many others have uh, been very involved in keeping the consortium right at the forefront of managing the legislation and, and uh, uh, keeping everyone in our profession aware of what's happening. Uh, Certainly the national standards uh, in adapted PE, you can see Luke Kelly is a major player in that, still remains a major part of it. That content is really the foundation. It's the rock in which we build everything on. And so it's been around since 96. We have well over 2,000 CAPES nationwide. And um, it's that content that uh, I believe will brings us together and also provides a foundation for us to move forward. Now, as we think about moving, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, good. Can as we think us, about, oh, go ahead. Uh, can you tell us what a cape is? What cape stands for? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Different. Yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah, thank you. A cape is a certified adapted physical educator. That's someone who has completed um, um, of the minimum eligibility requirements to sit for the national certification exam, which uh, is three credits in adapted PE, 100. Uh, excuse me, 200 hours of teaching children with disabilities in physical education setting, holds a current teaching license in physical education, um, and then makes application to uh, be, uh, become a national CAPE. Um, we have, like I said, over 2,000 CAPEs currently, and the profile of people who typically pass that national certification exam are people with six plus years teaching experience, they have a master's degree in adapted PE, they've attended state and national conferences, they have worked uh, endless hours in terms of working with children with disabilities on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, it's those people that really uh, champion the cause that we're, we're talking about. And if we think about the application of that information, this is one model that we often relate to, and it's this idea that we keep the learner at the center and we have a relationship between the learner, the task, and the environment. And so if we think about that application of that information, we may have situations in the schools where, you know, the, the whole what if. What if we want to teach a child how to ride a bike, a child with a disability, let's say a child with Down syndrome. And if we think of that particular child in terms of uh, what do we need to get that to happen, and if, if the traditional method isn't appropriate, then we need to think outside the box. And boy, it doesn't happen any better than, uh, than lose the training wheels. And some of you, so Garth Timerson up in was, uh, Michigan or Wisconsin, excuse me, has done some great work with this. And people in California and, and other places have used these series of, of bikes to help children, children with disabilities learn how to ride and be independent. So it's thinking outside of the box. And that's a part of adapted PE. And another example is to think from the standpoint of, as we work with children, what if, as we work in the elementary level, we think of a child or have a child who's inspired or empowered to be a climber, and they've learned that by participating in our in our gyms and using our climbing walls or participating in a developmentally appropriate game, and they go on and somewhere along the way there's an injury, but that dream still exists. That dream is still there, and we can show them what equipment they may need, may, may need to have in order to climb. We can use 
the knowledge and the, and the network of people that we have in order for them to still achieve that goal or that vision. And it's not lost just because of the injury. It's not lost just because of the disability. So it's taking that knowledge, that, that information that we have from APENS, and applying that. So if we jump to the next slide, you can see it's not necessarily the physical barrier. It's not necessarily the, um, the, the, the program. It's often just simply the attitude of the teacher. And the people who are on today all have great attitudes. I mean, I can think of one particular person who's our national teacher of the year, Mr. Dave Martinez, and his colleague, Amy Achenbacher, down in, uh, in Georgia. I mean, just fantastic folks to work with. And they're reaching out and working with children in both Special Olympics as well as the Paralympic movement. And it's their attitude that's so inspiring and, and uh, empowering. So if we look at other resources that we can tap into besides those local folks, you can see PE Central. This is just a list of a couple, a few, but PE Central, certainly one of the premier adapted PE or PE sites in the country. And uh, PE Central has some great information. This is a specific page dedicated to adapted PE. And, and I can say that uh, I'm humbled by the many colleagues who are involved with this particular page. And you can see that there's a list of uh, adapted PE experts, if you will. And you can write in a question. Ask that panel of people, beginning with Dr. Carol Ryan, Ryan and, uh, and some of my other really good friends who just, they're just fantastic people. Uh, Dr. Susanna Rocco Dillon up in, up in Michigan, she's doing great work. So it's people like that. That list of folks who are there are, are just fantastic resources for you to reach out to, touch base with, ask the question, how can I get my kids involved? If you're interested in specific issues um, in regards to the IEP or assessment, or maybe it's a particular disability that you're not aware of. You can click on that fact sheet book. You can visit the top adapted PE websites and bounce down to Texas Women's University and see some of the material they have there. It's just outstanding resources for, uh, for teachers, for service providers in the community, as well as for parents. So uh, please access that information. It's great. It's available to you. And uh, there's even some nice um, PDFs and, and information there that uh, that you can utilize. I think no better. Go ahead. We have a question that might be uh, pertinent to this slide. Uh, the question is, is there a location to find out whom are um, CAPE certified in each state? Uh, you, you can contact my office, the Adaptive PE National Standards Office, and you can ask for a list of CAPEs by state. Uh, we'd like to see that particular piece posted. Um, but it's currently not up at the moment, but it is something that you can access and I can pass on to you to find out which CAPEs are in your area, who you might uh, be able to contact if it's a person in higher education or if it's a person in the public school. Great question. And Tim's information will be posted at the end of the webinar as contact information, so um, that you'll have available to you. Super. Well, like I said, you know, some of the great, here's some CAPEs for you right now. If you click on the Anchor City School District, Boy, I tell you, this is this is the bar right here. This is the group that's really doing great work, and uh, uh, there's some fantastic leaders there. And, and one of those individuals is uh, Mrs. Pam Skogstad. She's just just a ball of energy, and she always has wonderful ideas. Whether she's working in the rural rural settings of Alaska or whether she's right in the heart of the city, and you can see their pictures there. Mr. Dave Poulin, who uh, has uh, initiated and, and really has brought the whole notion of Blaze Sports right to Alaska. He's uh, recently been recognized by that organization. And there's the whole crew, and, and uh, I applaud each and every one of them. They're all CAPE certified, and uh, I think that's just fantastic. They're those national certified adapted PE teachers who said, you know, I'm going to take this knowledge, I'm going to take this passion that I have, and I'm going to make a difference in the community where I live, where I work. And whether I'm working with adults and, and, and out in the community working on vocational skills and lifetime day-to-day -day things, or whether I'm down at that elementary, pre-K, preschool level, they're making a difference. And they're making a difference because they're, they, they know how to communicate, they know how to connect with each other, and they know how to reach out to others to make it happen. And so it's just a fantastic group there. Uh, I'm so uh, thankful to have uh, had the opportunity to work with them. There's a couple other websites there. Certainly you can see the TW website I mentioned. 
Palestra.com, fantastic resource uh, in terms of a journal uh, dedicated to adapted PE. Uh, but in terms of the sake of time, if we click to the next uh, slide, it's this idea of making it all work and bringing it all together. And I think Ann is going to be able to share with you some real, uh, you know, teeth in terms of the, the content that she has to share. And so I'm going to pass it off to Ann, and uh, thank you for your time. Tim, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be presenting with you today. And I want to thank you for painting a clear picture of the role of adaptive PE teachers and what a great resource and collaboration opportunity is for those of us who are working in the community setting. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the justifications for why physical education, adapted physical education, and then sport and physical activity in the community are so important for people with disabilities. I'll be touching on the legal justifications, public health, social, and the lifespan uh, equity justifications. And then I'm going to talk to you briefly about some collaboration strategies that we can use uh, as community program providers. In terms of the legal justifications, Americans with disabilities um, enjoy civil rights legislation and mandates that prevent discrimination in the community setting and in the educational setting, as well as in transportation, housing, employment, and all other areas of life that are important to us. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 were really the groundbreaking civil rights legislations that um, support the rights of people with disabilities in the United States. On the education side, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act uh, is, is sort of the civil rights mandate that ensures that students with disabilities are afforded a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. I'm going to talk to you in just a minute about the specific provisions that address physical education and extracurricular activities like sport and recreational program opportunities. And with that, I just wanted to mention two states that have um, state-specific legislation that is even stronger that goes beyond these national, ma excuse me, national mandates. And those are the states of Maryland and Louisiana. And this is an, an exclusive list. It's, it's two um, states and, and laws that I'm most familiar with. So if we can go to the next slide. On this slide, you'll see the federal regulations for physical education. And um, what I've done is put together a side-by-side -side of the IDEA regulations, the Rehab Act regulations, and the Americans with Disabilities Act so that you can see um, where physical education, sort of the, what the mandates are for physical education for students with disabilities. Under IDEA, students who are receiving special education services will have an individual education plan. And their IEP uh, may prescribe adaptive physical education services as part of the services the child needs to be able to um, receive the appropriate benefits of a, of a public education. Now, they may re be receiving physical education on an individual basis, as Tim said, in an adaptive environment or they may be receiving um, physical education in the regular physical education class with support from an adaptive physical educator, or eventually, as they you know, develop the skills that they need, um, may be just working through uh, general physical education teachers. Now, students with disabilities who are not receiving special education services um, will have a, a 504 plan if they have a physical disability or visual impairment. And that plan, uh, and they're certainly protected under, um, under these mandates to ensure that they have access to physical education just like any other student, and that they have access to adaptive physical education if necessary, again, to help them develop the motor and movement skills and sport-specific skills they need to be successful um, in you know, being physically active. Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act um, requires that school programs and services are provided in an accessible manner. So, so that will address sort of the physical facilities and structures of the schools and grounds and those sorts of things. 
and uh, playgrounds, tracks, all of those facilities, and certainly will ensure that a parent with a disability has access to their, you know, to their child's school as well. If we go on to the next slide. <clears throat> These are regulations for non-academic services, which in both cases, IDEA and the Rehab Act, encompass extracurricular activities like interscholastic sports, intramurals, after-school programs. Um, basically, students with disabilities must be provided an equal opportunity to participate and receive those services and activities. And the language in IDEA and the Rehab Act are very similar, um, as you can see. And this is going to be part of your handout, so you can read this information in more detail. But I just wanted to make sure that you had sort of a, a broad understanding of, of what the mandates are and that these programs and services you know, are required for students with disabilities. And the next slide. Now, when we're talking about athletics, interscholastic athletics, intramural sports, um, opportunities to participate in these programs and services are also mandated both under IDEA and the Rehab Act. Under IDEA, you can find this language in the non-academic services section, which uh, was on the previous slide, but I've repeated it here. So non-academic and extracurricular services and activities may include athletics, transportation, also mentions recreational activities. Under the Rehab Act, athletics is covered under the physical education provisions language, which was on the first slide. So students must have the opportunity um, to participate in the regular intramural and scholastic sports, you know, if appropriate. For example, if it's a no-cut sport and the, the athlete wants to wants to tr wants to participate, and it makes sense, and there's um, not a, a significant modification to the rules required, and that the safety um, of both the student with a disability and the other students participating. Um, is present, then that student should have and does have the right to participate in those regular programs. If, for any of those reasons that I just mentioned, the student is not able or eligible to participate in those, then the school must provide um, alternative opportunities in a, in a separate setting. Um, OK, next slide. Justifications for public health equity and social equity. These will be very familiar to everyone um, on the phone because we, we, we talk about these almost every day when we're talking about our programs and why they're important and what, you know, what the benefits are and really to justify you know, what we do and why we do it besides the fact that it's really a lot of fun, provides a lot of benefit um, to the folks who participate in our programs. We want to be able to talk about the cost-benefit proposition. Um, which uh, Tim alluded to earlier in terms of especially getting, with, getting children with disabilities when they're young and people who with newly acquired disabilities right away and giving them the opportunities to develop the motor and movement skills and then progress in their development of physical activity. It's really going to reduce the um, hospitalizations and secondary um, complications to their disabilities that may occur and that often occur if people with disabilities are sedentary and, and really inactive. Uh, another item under public health that I wanted to highlight was the self-reported self health status. This is something that people with disabilities score really low in compared to people without disabilities. So for instance, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention actually have some studies that indicate this, particularly among adults with disabilities who are from ethnic minority background. So obviously, we really want to pay attention to this, as I just mentioned, when folks are young so that they aren't experiencing really you know, poor quality health um, as adults, especially when they're in their prime and they should be active and healthy and really enjoying life. So important justification. Let's go on to social equity. This is another area, especially when we're talking about young folks, when we're talking about kids with disabilities, ensuring that they have the opportunities for social interaction and engagement you know, with peers with disabilities and with peers without disabilities is so critical. And it's something that unfortunately is missing for a lot of children with disabilities. So what, what we're able to do, as we know, through um, team sports 
and sort of group activities is really give, um, give young people the opportunity to become really adept at interacting socially in those environments, and then that those skills are transferable to all the other environments that they you know, are active in and want to participate in. So that's another really important piece that I know we all see the benefits of every day but want to be able to talk about, especially when we start talking to elected officials and policymakers. OK, next slide. Lifespan equity. This, again, is something that Tim uh, talked about in terms of the role of adapted physical educators really preparing young people with disabilities for the lifespan and giving them the skills and tools they need to be successful in physical activity and really leading healthy lifestyles throughout the rest of their lives. It ensures that self-actualization that self takes place. Um, it, it's really important that it happens early on, as I've mentioned. It builds confidence and self-esteem in the participants. It gives them the tools to make sound decisions and um, be active participants in all the areas of life that are important to them. And it really establishes a, a, an important foundation for independence and self-determination in their lives as they develop. So where does this happen? It happens in a variety of different settings. And certainly the educational transition planning period is critical. And that's a place where those of us who work in the community setting, again, can really benefit um, young you know, students in the school systems and adapted physical educators and making sure that that bridge exists between the school-based services and opportunities and community-based programs and resources. So that there's a, a continuation, a continuum of activity and growth and development um, for those young people. Post-secondary opportunities, I know for me that was critical, going away to college as a person, as a young person with a new disability and getting an education and having that social um, support network, having the opportunity to compete and develop in sport as an elite athlete and um, also develop the, the um, educational skills and tools to be successful in my career. And that's something we want for all kids with disabilities. And then certainly the community-based programs are also a, a, a critical place that we can address this. Many of us are working with people with disabilities from you know perhaps the age of six all the way up to 56 or 76. But these are opportunities for us to ensure that Whenever somebody comes into our program, we can help address, um, you know, lifespan equity and self-determination um, to really enhance the quality of their life. Okay, next slide. So collaboration strategies. Development and maintenance of adapted physical activity across the lifespan requires support and collaboration of the home, school, community, and government entities. OK, next slide. So what can we do to help facilitate some of that collaboration? Um, one of the things that we have at our disposal is a really unique way to deliver disability awareness. And, and uh, you know, our programs and services are so you know, there's something that people want to do. They want to touch and feel and experience. So what better way to really promote and raise awareness about what we do than to actually hold a Paralympic Day in the school or a Paralympic Day in the community? You know, work with the adaptive physical educators and the, and the school administrators and offer to, to organize something like this. And we can provide you with some resources if this is of interest to you. Um, certainly at, at Blaze Sports, we have a program that's based on the Paralympic Day in the Schools program that we ran during the 96 Atlanta Paralympic Games. And at the International Paralympic Committee, there's a Paralympic School Day program that has activity cards and other resources available. Um, again, this is, a, this is a great thing to do in the community, maybe at a community festival where all people are gathering. And really, the intent is to raise awareness about 